Hunt. Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carvel and I'm Al Hunt. Thanks for joining us. This week we're joined by David Lanhart of the New York Times, a premier economics columnist and correspondent. Remember, we take your questions each episode, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can. Don't forget, tell us where you're from. This episode is sponsored by our friends Magic Spoon. Please check out their link in the show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Okay, James, a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. We got to start with the House Republicans dumping Liz Cheney. Her sin, she stood up to Trump's lie that uh, the election was stolen, uh, and uh, the rest of her colleagues don't want people to know that Trump is a loser, I guess, or won't admit it publicly. She'll be replaced by Elise Stefanik, you know, the, new, the young New Yorker who put her principles in a blind trust to become a Trumpite. This is the party of Trump, and you've got to go along with a big liar, anything else he wants. James, if you look at Liz Cheney and Elise Stefanik on taxes, on the border, on national security, whatever were the litmus test, doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. All that matters is his fealty to Donald Trump. And maybe they can get away with that, but I have my doubts. Uh, I think, as Liz Cheney said, ignoring the lie emboldens a liar. I don't think she's going to slink into the night. First of all, uh, they're doing exactly what Republican voters want them to do. The Republican voters don't care about taxes or deregulation or anything like that. They, they care about Trump and his brand of Trumpism, which is the politics of resentment. Now, one of the interesting things is a, a Republican observer said, well, look, if, if there was a climate denier in this place, the Democrats would kick them out. So we should kick Liz Cheney out because she's denying that the election was stolen. If, if the fact that we're having climate change is in any way comparable to the fact that there was not a stolen election. I mean, it, it's insane. And their party has, is insane. And there's just in, in Liz Cheney is the latest victim of, of this insanity. And they're insane because their voters demand they, that they be insane. That, that's what it is. At least Stefani or whether we voted for the tax cut. You know, if she's going to support Trump, that's who they want. It's got to get over the myth that there's some Republican Party that is driven by any ideology. It is totally driven by resentment. And if the Republican politicians don't do that, they're not going to get reelected, plain and simple. They're not going to win primaries. Uh, that's plain and simple. You know, right. m many of these uh, members, I'm told, no, the election really wasn't stolen, but that doesn't matter because it's important that we keep that line. You know, when it came, when it comes to taxes, when it comes to climate, when it comes to national security, I don't think a lot of Republicans thought it was a big lie to say tax cuts bolster the economy, nor did I think Democrats thought it was a big lie to say that these tax increases are important for equity's sake. Those are argumental. Those are very, those are very valid arguments. I don't know what they tell their children. Because what they're advocating is a big lie, and there's no way around it. I don't think it's going to go away. Jeff Greenfield, who I like a lot, said, hey, Democrats are counting on some kind of Republican uh, ruptures uh, to help them. Uh, it's not going to happen. Never does. Maybe he's right. I think this is different. You know, I take some issue that there's actually a ton of evidence that cutting taxes on rich people does not produce economic growth. And in fact, the only thing that it does is make rich people richer and decrease the revenue to the federal government. I mean, they can say it, but they just don't have any well, evidence That's not quite true. They're they're not evidence. So I, I agree with you. I agree with you, I, but there I, are studies that, that I, I think I, are I, in the minority. I think they're wrong. It's different than saying the election was stolen. It really is. I, 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 there, I agree it's different, but it's just economics is just history has shown pretty conclusively that it doesn't, but it's okay. Right. It's not, it's a say, well, I think this, okay. It, 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 it's, I understand where you're yeah. getting at it. Just, they're, they're just divorcing the truth. All they want is resentment all the time. And if you don't give them that, they're not going to vote for you. It's that simple. Yeah, and that's what they're stuck with. And what they don't understand, some of them, I believe, is that this isn't the end for Donald Trump. This isn't, okay, the election was stolen. I'm not going to have any more demands. 
I mean, uh, the Prince of Mar-a-Lago is going to be making demands every month, every week, every day. And they're going to have to go along every time or they're going to get in the same problems that Liz Cheney got in. And uh, go ahead. So I, let's say I'm a professional Republican, of right. which we know a lot of, you know, lobbyists, government relations people. And they just do better when there is a Republican administration. If I were one of them, I would hope that Donald Trump runs in 2024. Because think about this for a second. Trump is a, not not that you can possibly have it, but Trump is a sort of moderate version of Trumpism. If he doesn't run, they'll be for guns and coffins, right? Because the whole, they will just have, I I can out-Trump you. And that's what is going to happen in a Republican marketplace. They're much better off if Trump is a party that wants to have power and not lose a ton of seats, them much, I think they're better off with Trump running in 2024. They all with him not because it'll just... So how does he affect the off-year elections uh, next year? You know, uh, to be seen. We don't know how they're going to turn out without him on the ballot. We don't know how we're going to turn out without him on the ballot. Uh, And, you know, I'm sure he'll inject himself in there and primary some people and and everything else. But... it, it's a lot of unanswered questions about 2022, and we just got to admit that we just got to sit back and wait and see how the economy goes, because history is not with us. Redistricting is not with us. Sorting is not with us. There are a lot of headwinds for 2022. But the biggest unknown is what happens with Trump not on the ballot. In 2018, was, uh, uh, you know, it was a different political environment, you know, circumstance in 2022, but we did pretty good. And I hope we run a 2018 campaign in 2020. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about Democrats' prospects because there's so much going against them. But uh, I think actually if, if, if Trump becomes more of a nuisance and more of a problem and more of a, uh, you know, a real thorn in their side, uh, for Republicans, maybe that helps. But you, you have everything you mentioned, redistricting, the cycle, and voter suppression, uh, candidates, um, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a worrisome landscape, but maybe, maybe, maybe Trump can change that for the Democrats. We'll see. Um, James, maybe. Maybe. I'm not as pessimistic well, I hope you, as you. hope you're right. Uh, let's look 5,000 miles away or 4,000 miles away. The Israeli Palestinian fighting is the worst it has been in years. Israeli airstrikes, Hamas rockets, street fighting, dozens dead, hundreds, seriously wounded. James, you've worked on campaigns in Israel. You know the country. How serious is this? All right, so I, I spoke to our, the show's really good friend, Jim Gerstein, who, who is an Israeli citizen. He has family over there. Let, let's talk about some things that make this troubling. First of all, there's street violence, right? A lot of this is related to the settlement. If they, in Israel, the, the Palestinians and, and the Jews, in many instances, live in close proximity. So it's just not the rockets coming in. They're having fights in the streets and supermarkets and everything else. That that really makes this differently. Uh, it, it's, this is unsurprising, but it's being primarily driven by Palestinian youth. And <clears throat> the settlements... I can't tell you how much worse the settlements have made the situation because you just keep encroaching, encroaching on Palestinian lands. They see how much better off that the Jewish population in Israel lives than they do, and it's eternally frustrating. Uh, you know, we had a chance in the late 90s to, to do something, and it came close. It, it wouldn't be perfect, but it would have been a lot better. You wouldn't have had these settlements. You'd have had some, you know, some functioning hierarchy for them to deal with. But I think most people, that, most Israelis that think about this are, are really quite concerned that this is just going to manifest itself more and more in the future because the, these settlements have just aggravated the situation in, in ways that we can't imagine. Now, of course, if you're an Israeli family, shit, you, you, want, you want peace. And the guy who's thinking he might benefit from this is probably Netanyahu. And as Israelis say, it's being overwell being. And they're 
this is going to cause, you know, right now, Israeli politics is in a, it's always in turmoil, it's probably greater turmoil than it's ever been in, and I don't, this will probably add to the turmoil. So it's a, it, it, it's not a favorable situation over there. It's really not. Yeah, I think you're right about Netanyahu. I think he could be a beneficiary. He looked like, you know, once again, he was on his last legs. The other side was trying to put together a coalition. Not sure they would have made it. This probably makes it harder. Uh, he, if, he, if he can stay in office, he can probably avoid a trial. He's under indictment. Uh, he will do and say anything necessary to survive in power. I think uh, it would have been a welcome for everyone if Netanyahu was replaced. But I think this is something, this is for him... Uh, it's a life raft, and uh... yeah, and, and there's a lot of ramifications. Some of these other Arab states, like the UAE and Qatar, and some have sort of established diplomatic right. relations with Israel. It's to be interesting to see how their street, because these autocrats, they pay attention to yeah, the street. Yeah, let me tell yeah, you, they sure do. And don't know, but it, this is a, a you know, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of it is fueled by technology and a, you know, and some. You know, Palestinian version of TikTok. Social media is all over the place. It, 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 it right. It's, and it, as long as they insist on the, the occupation, it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult under the best of circumstances to have, you know, Palestinians and Jews live in Israel in the, you know, best of circumstances. It, this is the worst of circumstances. It really makes it impossible. It does. I'll tell you who else it's uh, difficult and challenging for is Joe Biden. Uh, presidents always come in and the focus is on their domestic agenda. It's their original State of the Union, their budget proposal. And then, and then more often than not, some kind of foreign policy crisis occurs, which gets in the way. Uh, very few presidents, if any, have been better prepared for it than Biden, but uh, it's difficult. He's a longtime supporter of Israel, but uh, I think a lot of a lot of his um, constituents, a lot of people are going to say, wait a minute, you can't let this kind of repression go on the way it is. He, he's going to, it's awfully hard for him to keep hands off. Maybe he will, but it's hard. Right. You know, when people say, if, if, I think, I'm certainly describe myself as a supporter of Israel, right? But I'm I'm not a supporter of the settlements, and, and but they have decided to do this, and the consequences of this decision are, are being played out here on a daily basis now. And it, look, it may just most of them recede. Uh, this at some point may recede. People just get get tired of it. But it, it's not going to go back to the way it used to be. And I'm just going to advance more, and, and it's not going to solve it. And the younger people that are now are going to keep these same, you know, aggressiveness. And the, as they grow older, and they'll be and it, it, the, the big problem with the youth, where people don't have hope, it, it, it's, it's a bad situation. And I think that's what's driving a lot of this. One of the most, one of the most admirable countries in the world with one of the most screwed up political systems in the world. It really is remarkable uh, that, that, a, that yeah. a country, I know it's young, it's only what... Uh, you know, 75 years old like or whatever. It's, it's younger yeah, it than is. me. <laughs> me too. It's younger than but, me. But uh, uh, still, uh, you would think they could somehow get a better political system, but they can't. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid your your dire warnings about what could be ahead um, may may prove correct. Anyway, let's... We, yeah, we're probably not the best people to lecture other people about their political that's true. system right now. <laughs> We've always been proud of ours. It doesn't seem, doesn't seem to be doing Good point. very well. Hey, James, as the author of the famous campaign slogan, it's about the economy, stupid, you appreciate the importance of the economy. New York Times columnist and newsletter uh, author uh, and just extraordinary, uh, really economics expert extraordinaire, David Lanhart is our guest today. David, uh, I read everything you write. I learned every time I do, but I was especially taken by a piece you did last week on taxes. And you wrote that the cries of these corporate types and conservatives and Republicans that Biden would impose devastating, radical, socialistic taxes on we poor Americans, especially upper income, it's just not true. 
That's right. Well, first of all, thanks for that generous introduction. I'm thrilled to be with both of you. Um, yeah, it just appears not to be true, right? I mean, uh, when you look at history, one of the things you see uh, is that the American economy uh, has done really quite well when taxes on corporations and the wealthy have been quite high. Um, we obviously, this you know, this isn't a laboratory, so we can't know for certain, but boy, the evidence seems strong. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, tax rates were extremely high. The U.S. economy boomed. Um, as James well knows, when, when Bill Clinton raised taxes on the wealthy, Republicans predicted it would be the end of the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy did pretty well in the 90s. Um, uh, and, you know, there are three or four other examples. It's not that taxes don't matter. It's just that in the range where we are right now, the idea that that is the main thing that's that determines the health of the economy is wrong. And there are ways in which higher taxes might hurt the economy, but there are also ways in which higher taxes help the economy. Well, uh, let me just focus on the corporate tax for a second, because critics like Susan Collins say, hey, if we take that top corporate rate back to, you know, up to 28 percent, was 35 percent five years ago, from 21 percent, that's going to put American businesses at a huge disadvantage globally. What do you say? I mean, I don't think there's a ton of evidence for that. Um, the promises that we heard after the 2017 tax cut about what it would do for the economy were largely not borne out. The economy was doing fine before the tax cut. It continued to do fine after the tax cut. It might have done a little bit better after the tax cut, um, but by some by some measures it didn't. And the specific promises about what corporations would do in terms of investing in the economy, they just didn't come to bear. And so when you when you sort of look back over this, to say that the corporate tax rate is what will determine how well our economy is doing is not something that has evidence to it. It's just sort of a matter of faith. It's people who want to believe that. The thing that we know is that cutting the corporate tax rate will increase the after-tax profits of corporations and will help people who own stock in those corporations. It, it may not help the American economy writ large, but it's basically a subsidy to those corporations. So I understand why the corporations want the corporate tax cut. We all like money. Um, but they justify it in this way, which is it'll be good for all of you. Ju that just doesn't, that just isn't consistent with the facts. Let me ask you about one provision that kind of fascinates me. Eyes roll over when you mention it, but it becomes quite controversial in the Democratic Party. And that's one, I, I thought that 17 bill was a terrible bill. One thing it did was it limited the deductions you can take for state and local taxes. Now, in high tax places like D.C., that probably hurt us, but there's an equity argument here too. Some Democrats are saying it's got to be fully restored. What? Give me your view on the dynamics of, of, of state and local tax deductions. Well, so, I mean, I think there are Democrats now who are basically saying, as you said, unless that's fully restored, we won't support anything. My instinct is that's a negotiating tactic and they won't right. stick to it. But I think the Democrats, if they allow this entire package to collapse over that, um, uh, they would almost certainly be making a tactical mistake because th there are legitimate arguments on both sides of this issue. On the one hand, a bunch of the higher tax states are also the states that are more prosperous in our country, right? Um, so California, and New York tend to have higher taxes. They also have larger, stronger economies, and they send a lot of money to those lower tax states through the federal government. Um, and so as long as we have a federal system where you have states like California and New York basically subsidizing other states, I think it, it, you can see the defense for why we may also allow the taxpayers in those states to get deductions for it. The flip side of it is um, the federal government now does uh, or did subsidize in a major way um, uh, states that charge larger taxes than others. And I get the argument that conservatives offer that, that basically says we should be doing less of that. I think there's a fair question of where in the spectrum you want to be on that. Um, boy, it feels like it would be a mistake if Democrats kind of tanked the whole thing over these regional issues. I don't expect they will, but you never know. Yeah. James. So uh, one economics question, I, I want to talk to you about the pandemic. I, I happen to think you're polymath and economics is one of your areas of expertise. But one of the ideas that people have told me, and I just want you to react to it, is the corporate income tax. Do away with it in tax dividends and capital gains as ordinary income. In other words, have the tax when you distribute the profits. Does that make any sense to you? Or is that just somebody being clever on a napkin um, in a bar? I don't think it's crazy. So 
Um, I mean, Mitt Romney got in a lot of trouble for saying, you know, corporations uh, are people, right? Corporations don't pay taxes, people pay taxes. But the larger idea that in the end there isn't some, some entity that pays taxes, that it's just people who pay it, is correct, right? General Motors didn't get up this morning. Um, when we tax General Motors, um, we're mostly taxing its shareholders. And so essentially saying, you know what, let's stop with all this stuff. Let's, let's not tax corporations. Let's instead impose um, more significant taxes on wealthy people um, who tend to own the who tend to own the stock. Let's get rid of this preference for stock holdings over work in our tax code. Uh, the theory of that to me is actually quite alluring. I think the problem becomes: look, that's not the way most states, most countries do it, right? And so if we move uh-huh. to that, it 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 gets us out of step with most of the world. And so I guess the way what I think is if if you could imagine a benevolent <laughs> dictator or god coming and changing the entire global tax system to move to the one you just mentioned James, I don't think that would necessarily right. be crazy. My concern is that in the real world we would get the zeroing out of the corporate tax and we wouldn't get the hikes you would need on the individual taxes to make up for it. And it would end up being a big giveaway. Uh, I want to talk to you about the pandemic and you've written about it. And of course, there's going to be thousands of books and retrospectives and studies and everything else. But when you historians look back on the fact that we suspended the J&J vaccine, was this the right thing to do or looking back on it, it was not the right thing? I think the suspension of the J&J vaccine probably has bigger uh, costs than benefits. So um, this is a hard situation for regulators, right? Because these were really serious side effects. Um, uh, But they were extremely rare. They, it was possible to monitor them, both by alerting people to what they were and by basically saying, look, they seem to be concentrated in one group, women between the ages of roughly 80, 18 and 50. And so maybe what we should do is basically um, say we're not going to, we're going to pause the J&J vaccine for them, but we're going to continue giving it to other people. Or maybe we should warn people, but keep doing it. By picking the relatively extreme policy that they did, which is different from, say, how Britain dealt with some similar problems with the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, basically they did two things. One, they caused an immediate short-term um, real plummeting in the number of Americans getting vaccines every day. Um, and two, they just raised massive doubts, not just in this country, but around the world about the J&J vaccine. The effects for the U.S. are likely to be temporary. We're sort of quickly getting to the point where if you want a vaccine, you're going to be able to get it. And so the J&J being offline for a few weeks was only a temporary problem. It was still a real problem. I mean, look, there were people um, who would have gotten the J&J vaccine um, and would have been spared COVID and who instead got it during those few weeks and who will be hospitalized or die because of it. Those pe- those people exist. They are more numerous than the side effects would have been. So the costs were real. I, I, more, I worry more in the long term about what we may have done to the reputation of the J&J vaccine, which appears to be an enormously powerful vaccine with extremely rare side effects um, by doing the full pause. Right. My 23-year-old just got the J&J vaccine, and I said, I, I, I honestly, take any one you can, but I'm kind of glad you got that one. Because? You know, it's a kind of one and done, yeah. and you got really good protection, you know, and you're 23. I mean, I, I, she might not go get the follow-up shot. You don't, you don't know what young people are going to do. But I was, as a parent, I got to tell you, I was glad that the J&J vaccine was available. All right, let me move on on the on the, and you know we're going to come, and I know this is kind of uh, ad hoc, but how do you think high end public health has performed in this crisis in the United States? And I, when I say high end public health, you know what I'm talking about: Johns Hopkins and the T.F. Chan School and the UCLA School of Public Health, or whatever you have. How would you grade them right now? Um, I think it's been mixed. So 
first of all, there let's acknowledge that that the, our public health system had an extremely difficult challenge in 2020, which is we had a president of the United States who denied obvious scientific facts, who made up things, who tried to undermine experts. And trying to be uh, an epidemiologist, an official at the CDC or the FDA um, during that period is enormously difficult. Um, and they bear no responsibility for the falsehoods that the president, former president, said about the virus. It, it made their lives and their jobs much, much more difficult. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, that they basically had the leader of the country pushing against what they were trying to do. So that's a kind of a high degree of difficulty. Um, I also think they've gotten a lot of things right. I mean, if you look at the development of the vaccines, it's a miracle. And our government agencies and, and universities um, and scientists, they're the ones who did that. And so there's a lot they've gotten right. And then finally, before I get to where I think you're, you're asking me to go with this, James, I think I think also let's remember there's a huge amount of variety when we talk about the sort of public health infrastructure, right? There, there's, there are huge disagreements within it. Now, having said all that, I also think there have been kind of significant mistakes that, that our public health leaders and experts, some of them, have made. Um, I think they haven't been trusting enough of ordinary people. I mean, the fact that they waited to tell us to, that masks are good until they had some specific study that talked about masks and COVID, that, that's not the right way to do this. There were all kinds of basic logical reasons to think that masks could help. I mean, I, I happened to be in China in November 2019 before anyone was talking about COVID, all kinds of people in China and other parts of Asia wear masks because they, they have health benefits to protect you from contagious diseases. And so the idea that, that the public health authorities weren't coming out and being honest with us about that and were instead had this paternalistic attitude of, well, wait a second, if we tell the people about masks, they might overhear us or they might take all the doctor's masks. I think that was a big mistake. And then now... I think public health officials, again, are, are making uh, new mistakes, which is they're just inundating us with all this complicated, overly overly cautious in many ways pieces of advice. I mean, there is no evidence that outdoor masks, unless you're in a close conversation or a tight outdoor space with 10 other people, um, matter. And yet they're just not willing to say that. And I think it I, I think it undermines their credibility. And I just think they should be more honest with us. They should trust people more. Um, and they should not be quite so cutesy about um, uh, needing to defend absolutely everything with, with one specific study. That's not actually the smarter approach. You know, I, this is just this is in line with an observation I have. And I, and when this thing broke, I I, I, I knew it was serious from the get go. But I, my doctor has got an MPH in public health, from like UCLA. He's on the faculty at the medical school, and he, he just he told me in early March of 2020. I said, if I get this, I'm going to survive. He said, do everything you can not to get it. You don't want this. And I, I paid close attention. This is my sort of observation, though. It seemed that public health and liberals, I, I agree with most of the recommendations, they just seemed enthusiastic <laughs> about it. You know, you got to lock down. It's good. You'll be at home. Don't go out. Don't go outside. Wear a mask. I, I, I mean, it, it looked like they were happy to chastise people to not take the advice. And I, I'd sit there and I'd watch MSNBC, uh, I'd watch CNN. And if I was an ordinary person, I'd say, they, they actually seem happy about this. I mean, I, I, my kid's not in school. I mean, this thing is like slaughtering me. And these guys are doing, you know, FaceTime, you know, television hits, you know, making tons of money off the stock market and the houses. And I think it caused a lot of resentment. I, I think our communications, well, well Basically, most of the recommendation of social distancing and mask wearing or getting vaccinated were terrific. I, I, I do think we had a little a communications problem here. We just seemed too happy. About I agree. And, I, and I'll confess, I don't totally understand it. So the mistake that conservatives and Republicans have made have gone in the other direction, right? They've, they've treated not wearing masks as some great statement of freedom rather than what it is, which is it's potentially you could cost yourself your life or you could cost one of your parents their lives by not wearing masks indoors and by not taking precautions. I get that because it's sort of wrapped up in this notion of freedom, even if it's really wrongheaded. I, I, I don't know whether either of you have an explanation on this, but I don't totally get 
why so many people on the left half of the political spectrum have basically been eager to go too far in the other direction and imagine that the goal here uh, is somehow to get to absolutely no COVID risk as if that were possible. Yeah, I, well, it's it's a little bit of the culture on the left, all right, and that we're all, you know, everything we shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, the, the left hates laughing. And I'm talking about not the left. Like I consider, I consider myself a liberal, by the way. Okay, I am not a moderate. I'm in just about any test that I take. I do these sort of things, and you know, grade what you are. I try to give as honest answer as I can, and I always come out on the pretty liberal side of it. But the the real left, it's like I remember on election night, I said, okay. Put your ambient and you know, razor blades back in a medicine cabinet. You think we're going to lose, but we're not. It, it, it turned out to be one of my better moments. And I got heavily criticized on the left for making light of suicide. As if I was like addressing, saying that suicide wasn't an issue in the United States. I mean, some of these people utterly have no sense of humor. And that's it. Stay in, be a vegan, see no one, go on top the mountain. I I don't know, you know, and, and, you know, be careful what you call anybody because you can offend people. And it just, it drives me crazy. Just speak English, man. That's all you can do. It's a wonderful language. Try it sometimes. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that's my analysis of it. Al? <laughs> David, let me get you, I'm going to go back to your macroeconomic cap for a moment. The jobs report, was it a, a blip, a one month blip or was it a red flag um, about the economy? I mean, I guess the obvious answer is if I knew that, I'd be sitting on a beach rather than talking to you guys and working as a journalist. But um, uh, I think you never want to you never want to overreact to a single month's of data, a single month's worth of data. It's often the case that one month um, ends up being the blip. In other cases, it's the start of a trend and we can't really know that yet. I, I guess what I so I would look at kind of the larger forces here. Um, uh, I think for the most part, uh, I would say there are more reasons to be optimistic about the economy's growth than to be worried about it. Um, uh, you know, that people do not have huge amounts of debt. We're not talking about the post-financial um, crisis period. Um, consumer balance sheets look pretty good. Um, the federal government has just pumped large amounts of money into the economy um, through these various bills. Um, I do think there's a lot of pent-up demand. I do think a lot of people want to get out and go on a vacation or, uh, you know, start going out to eat more and, and doing stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I, I think th th those kinds of things are real reasons to think that it's kind of a blip. There are a couple of tricky issues, though, that we haven't yet figured out how to solve. And so um, it does look like we could have months and months more of something that's not totally normal. And um, look, if schools open only every other week or three days a week, that prevents a huge number of parents from going back to work. And if we don't get schools back to, to like normal, I don't mean, you know, I don't mean a hybrid of you're online some days and you're not online. I mean normal. If we don't get daycare centers and schools back to normal, um, that's going to keep a lot of people from going back to work. Um, I'm open to this Republican argument that, that the jobless benefits are keeping some people from going back into the workforce. I've yet to see actual evidence of that. Um, I know it's become the big Republican talking point. I'd want to see some evidence like who, 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 why are the reasons to think this is actually a big issue? Um, so I'm mostly optimistic, but, um, but I do think that we are in this situation in which um, the it's important. This sort of ties together the two parts of the conversation, the economy and COVID. If we take months and months and months and months to get back to, to normal, um, it's going to have all kinds of, of deleterious effects. It's going to affect people's mental health. It's going to affect kids' ability to learn. It's going to affect a lot of people's ability to go back to work. And yes, it's going to affect our economy, and, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. Well, in the same vein, uh, looking and, and appreciating what you said earlier that it's not a it's not a science, it's not exact. But but uh, on the debate between Larry Summers uh, and Jay Powell on whether uh, there's a, a, a danger of, I guess, really big inflation and soaring interest rates uh, or not, uh, which do you find more persuasive? I think that um, I think the strongest point in in Powell's on Powell's side, which is clearly also Biden and Pelosi's side, is that um, for, you know, basically this entire century so far, we have made the other mistake. 
Um, the Fed has repeatedly done too little to spark growth. Economic growth has again and again and again come in under what economists were forecasting. And I don't mean the next month. I mean when you say to economists, how much do you think the economy will grow next year? They've consistently been too optimistic. So growth has been the problem, um, not inflation, again and again and again and again. And so, you know, I guess I sort of like you think about it, if, if, if you're having a problem again and again and again and again, sometimes you do want to risk overcorrecting because if you keep making the mistake of undercorrecting, um, maybe you want to take the other risk. And, and I think that to me, that's part of the strongest argument for the Powell side. I think the point that Summers made that, that I think should weigh on Democrats a little bit is he pointed out, and this wasn't the thing that got the most attention, but he pointed out that in their zeal to pass a huge stimulus bill, they were necessarily paying less attention to the kind of long-term fundamental changes in the economy that they now have the, the opportunity to pass. And I think if the Democrats can't do some of their further legislation, if they can't take steps to strengthen labor unions, if they can't invest in infrastructure, if they can't raise taxes on the wealthy, and it looks like that they instead used their kind of legislative moment just to pass this massive um, stimulus bill, I, I think they could end up regretting that. Um, and so that didn't get as much attention as Summers' point, the argument that they're doing too much here. But it's worth, I think it's worth Democrats grappling with that risk. James. Well, I, you know, on the inflation thing, and, and I'm here in South Mississippi, and I'm going to tell you, the Highway 90 is full of, you know, help wanted, McDonald's, you know, $50 for an interview. I mean, that that's a a labor shortage, I, I suspect maybe the way to cure it is to pay people more, which they don't want to do. And my brother is a contract in Baton Rouge, and by Baton Rouge standards, he's, he's pretty, for scale of one to ten, he's probably a seven and a half by Baton Rouge standards. He said, I'm telling you, inflation is coming. We're just getting killed with lumber prices, steel, you know, finding labor. I, I mean, this is sometimes in, you live in Washington, it's just such an affluent area, and you say, well, we're doing fine, but uh, you know, maybe it's not in the rest of the country. Well, to the extent of the, that I see the rest of the country, there's a labor shortage yeah. out there. And, and and materials are getting – but I, I got your brain here, I, I, and I'll turn it over to Al. How serious is this chip shortage thing? Because you keep hearing – a lot about it and it's slowing down like auto. Is that something to worry about? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, as a journalist allowed to say, is anyone allowed to say, I don't know in 2021 in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That That's the, that's the full okay. answer. I think, right. you know, I think I, I've sort of learned I'm an optimist by nature. So my, 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 my instinct on many of these things is to say, well, it probably won't be a problem. But, you know, if there's anything we've learned over the last decade or so, it's that, you know, lots of things that probably won't be a problem can actually be really big problems, right? Like, we didn't think someone who rejected American democracy would win the White House. We didn't think we'd have a once in a century pandemic. And so, um, uh, you know, there, the, it, it seems like, put it this way, if you're trying to figure out, is this worth any of my brain space? I think that that clears the bar of it's worth some of your brain space. Yeah, the only thing that I turn it back over to Al, a, a very knowledgeable friend of ours said the thing that worries him the most is Taiwan produces a lot of chips. China, not so much. Right. And that just may make Taiwan a lot more attractive to mainland China. That's just something and, to and think I, about. And look, Taiwan is already... As if, as if it, as if it could even be more attractive, right? I mean, I was just right. looking at some of the history on this. It's amazing when you look at the famous Nixon reopening of China. Um, uh, uh, you know, China basically had one request, right? Kissinger and Nixon had like ten requests of China. China had one, which is um, uh, Taiwan. That was that was the full request, right? And Nixon said yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, James, I want to wrap this up by talking to you, David's daughter uh, is becoming a political junkie. Young daughter, what advice would you give her? Well, if I was David, I might give us some antibodies against him. Once, once you get bit, it, 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 it's really hard to get it out of your system. I, you know, I, I would say I've had a you know very fortunate life in politics, and there's nothing to me more exhilarating than working on a project that has a definitive outcome and really has an impact on the way people live. You know, every November, you're going to know whether you want a loss. And the, the, the thing that I would say to your daughter is, you know, no matter at what level you do this, it matters who's in charge. 
All right, it, it matters who wins the election, and so you know, some people go in life, and you know, maybe at Citibank or you had J.P. Morgan or you had something. I don't know how much that you know they all about the same to me, a Coke, a Pepsi, you know. But when you're in politics, you, you know how you did, and you know if what you did really has an impact. So I, 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 I wish you'd. Well, that's great well. advice. But if your father said, "Dad," I'd, I'd say, "Why don't you try philosophy?" <laughs> <laughs> Or Middle semiconductor chips. Medieval English. Yeah, semiconductor chips. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll end yeah. with my own recommendation, which is War Room, which we just watched, uh, which, of course, James is the star of, a documentary. Um, boy, right. does it age well. Um, almost 30 years later, uh, it was my second time watching it, and it was great. And even for people who weren't born, as some of your audience would not have been uh, during the 1992 political campaign, it's fascinating. And one of the most fun things is to pick out all the people who've gone on to be famous who just walk through the screen for about 15 seconds seconds, like the current White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain. Uh, well, Mike yeah. Donlin was in there a lot. You know, it's, uh, Mike Waldman, we had him on the show last week. He's doing terrific work, uh, you know. Up at the, not to up mention, at the Brennan you know, Center, right? Uh, yeah, well, and, Paul, Ron, For those George, of you, I mean, you know, around in 2044, and you see David's daughter either running the presidential campaign or being the candidate. I want you to remember this show. It all started in 2021. David Lanhart, you have been terrific. Your wide ranging knowledge and expertise, and you can make these matters understandable to those of us that uh, find it uh, the, the difficult science. So thanks an awful lot. Thank you. This was a ton of fun. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, it's been, it was really fun. It really I enjoyed was. it. And I always look forward to what you have to say. Thanks, guys. That was great. All right, James, now to one of our favorite segments, question and answers. Our listeners are so smart and they ask such good questions. Let's start with John from Antioch, Illinois, who asked, how come we don't hear anything from Dick Cheney about how his daughter is being treated by Republicans? Uh, because Dick Cheney is not a popular figure in the Republican Party and you know, he's he's older, and I, I think he and his daughter are very close. I, I know that. And I don't think it's really in her interest for him to speak out. And I think they yeah. both understand I, it. I, there's, there's no Dick Cheney Republicans left. You know, I think that's right. And I think he also uh, will uh, do whatever she wants him to do. They are very close, as you say, and it's probably not in her interest to have him speak out now either. My, uh, my wife just walked in and announced that she was a Dick Cheney Republican, I so I should say that, I, okay, she is, all right. But I, I, I think they've concluded that it wouldn't be particularly helpful for him to speak out at this moment. Jim, and now I hope I get this right, James, in Bocas del Toro, Panama. Does that sound right to you? Oh, I mean, wow. I guess. I, I've been to Panama. I was, you, boy, you go to Panama. I was there like a probably three years ago, a couple of years ago. And Panama City looks like Denver, the, the amount of construction they have there. And a, a lot of it is like uh, Latin Americans that are, are moving there. But you ought to see the high rise. I mean, even Trump has a tower in Panama City. It's a great country. I love the, I love the whole. That's not an incentive to go there, the Trump, the Trump Tower. But, uh, you know, the rest right, is. Right, yeah. I go to New York and yeah. there's a Trump Tower. Anyway, there. Jim to, Jim asks, do you think the Democrats will ever be able to address the insidious problem of the corrupting influence of money in politics? Uh, I am not very optimistic unless you get a new Supreme Court. Uh, those decisions they've handed down, starting with Citizens United, make it very difficult. You're never going to take money out of politics, but... Uh, I think it's more, I, I think to do anything serious is, is going to be a long time away. So this is something that, because this is John Chait, who, as you know, is, I follow, I read every word that John Chait writes. And he wrote an analysis about Elizabeth Warren that she misdiagnosed what went wrong with a campaign. And of course, she did not, she relied on small donors. So in one sense, you say that's admirable. She doesn't take, you know, any contribution over a thousand dollars. And people would say, "Well, illegal women voters said so that's a great idea." Our friend Fred Wertheimer would say that's a great idea. The problem is, you become addicted to small activist donors, and the only way you increase donations is by feeding that activist 
furnace, if you will. And so it, there is, it's, it's, it's not a kind of a straight line to say if, if you, people should just not take back money, not take large donations, because if it makes you reliant on a small but active demographic within the party. I thought it was a very, I, I thought of that, and I thought it was an interesting observation. I'm not, of course I'm not suggesting to you that big money and powerful money is not a problem in American politics, but we, we need a better well, James, I, I agree that's the case sometimes, not always. I mean, Barack Obama, Barack yeah, Obama raised huge amounts of small contributions in the beginning. I don't think he was much affected uh, by that activist base. And John McCain did the same thing. Uh, back in uh, back in 2000, yeah, 2008. So Warren, right, Warren was an example of that, but I think it's more mixed than that. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's a, yeah, I'm not suggesting to you it's an absolute thing. I'm just saying that's an aspect right. of it that that you got to admit that this it, it, right. it can happen. Yeah. That's all. That's all. It's, it's, it's not 100%. I'm going to violate our rules and ask a good question that Aaron asked. The reason it's violating our rules, James, is Aaron does not tell us where he's from. Aaron, this is the last question you get unless we find out where you're from. And I, I, and I hope it's, it, it's Bocas del Toro, Panama, or someplace like that. Anyway, James, you'll love this. He said, I wonder if Trumpy is getting some of the big percentage collection fee on his fundraising scam. How can you find out? I, I don't have to find out. Okay, I, I can look out there. I'm looking at the bay here in Basin St. You know, it's the water is wet. I promise you. If you jump in there, you're going to get wet. There's nothing. There's nothing here to investigate. You know, he's skimming everything that he possibly can, and I just don't know what his cut is and what the rest of them are. But you know, Aaron's a great name in, in spin doctors. He was Moses spin doctor. He was the first PR flack. It was in the Old Testament. So to, to spin doctors, Aaron is a great name. We're all, we're all sons, we're all children of, of Aaron. Aaron, you ask a good question, too. Just next time, tell us where you're from. Duncan, who is from London, which, we, as we all know, is in the U.K., uh, asked, what was the biggest political upset that you remember or covered? Look, there are always upsets in Senate or House or sometimes gubernatorial elections. But, but over the longer haul, the biggest upset... I know maybe Trump would be in there, Trump getting the nomination if you look back a couple of years. Jimmy Carter, 1975, he was a peanut farmer out of office, and I don't think he was given any chance, really, 2 3% chance. Uh, and that was, that was an extraordinary run over the long run. There have been individual races that have been huge upsets, but I always remember the Jimmy Carter race, maybe because I prefer to think about that to Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I, I could I can understand that, but I mean the, the Trump 2016 was, you know, uh, look I thought the fact that we lost congressional seats this year was a big upset. No one was expecting that. Let's be honest, and it, it, we came within 42,000 votes of losing the whole damn thing. I mean, it, there's real lessons in this 2020 result, and I'm not confident that we learn in these lessons. Uh, James Liza in Puget Sound, Washington, says, I'm surprised how little, almost nothing, we're hearing or reading about Judge Amy Jackson's opinion on exposing the guidance documents DOG legal counsel put together for Attorney General Barr in relation to the Mueller investigation. This, she says, is, is really of huge importance, should be covered in every detail. Maybe the silence is due to the fact that we have to wait for Attorney General Garland to rule on the opinion? I, I, you know, I guess so. I, but I certainly asked, you know, Walter Dodge or Seth Waxman about it. But it did strike me as a big story. But the story is not going to go away because all the documents exist in the Justice Department. And whenever General Garland wants to release them, he'll do that. I, he's got a pretty full inbox right now. But I, I agree with, with, with our listener that it, it is a huge story. But it's a huge story that just got. It's got a lot of shelf life. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree totally. It's there. You know, James, this isn't the only stuff that's going to come out that had not come out so far yet. I'm repeating myself, but a couple years ago I had a dinner out in Seattle with Bill Ruckel's house, the now late, but it was the FBI director and the deputy attorney general who resigned after the Saturday Night Massacre, Nixon in 1973. And he said, just remember, what you see on the surface is only the surface. There's a lot more underneath it. And with Trump, boy, there is a lot more that's going to come out. And this is this could be one of the more incriminating ones. 
going to be a, it's it going to be unending. It's just going to be, and it's just going to be on Earth and more and more and more. We're going to stay global, uh, yeah. Brent in Sydney, Australia. You know, we have a good Australian uh, audience. We do. We yeah. get, a, yeah, we get some. Like, yeah, once somebody week. over there would invite us to do a Australia. program over there. I'd love to go to Australia and, and do a program. Oh, I love that much. I've, yeah. I've only been there once, but it, it's remarkable. And by the way, congratulations. They did a hell of a yeah, job. They, yeah, they really did. And it, in some ways, a very similar mm -hmm. country to ours. Well, size wise. You know, yeah. I mean, we certainly had a big, big population, but size wise and, you know, culturally and everything else. I mean, you're in Australia, you know, you feel like you're in the States, honestly. Brent asked, what impact? But, we but, touched on this, this earlier, but what impact will a potential Trump 2024 run have on the midterms? Do you think the specter of Trump will scare Democrats to the polls? That's a huge question. Uh, he certainly he certainly helped Democrats more than Republicans during the last off year election. He certainly helped Republicans more than Democrats uh, down ballot in the 2020 election. So I don't know the answer to that question. My gut feeling tells me is if I were a Democrat, I'd want to keep having Trump uh, as a boogeyman. But I don't know. I, I, I'll take minor issue. I, I think the Democrats had something to do with what our disappointing congressional performance in 2020. I, I think a lot of, uh, certainly Trump had something to do with it, but I, but I think it, it's fair to say that the Democratic communication and recruiting effort was off. Yeah, time. James, it was. But I'm, I'm citing our friend Jim Gerstein, who we talked about earlier, who said that what, 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 what worried them a little bit was Trump brought out voters for him and against him. Those people, those independent suburbanites who came out against them, some of them, just a slice, then returned to their natural inclinations and split their ticket or voted Republican down ballot. Those he brought out, those low propensity voters, tended to just vote straight, straight ticket. And uh, yeah, so I, it's I both. Agree. It's not, it's, yeah, it's you're a, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't. I agree with everything. Well, that's good boy. That's a that's a great place to be, huh? <laughs> that's that's yeah. rare for you too, James. Kind of. That's a very it is. very Clinton. Really is. Leona from Tiburon, California. Why is Tucker Carlson and Fox News spreading such dangerous disinformation about vaccines? Is it because their audience are clamoring for such lies to increase ratings? Are they trying to undermine the successful COVID vaccine program being administered by Biden? Why? You know, it, it, Michael Lewis points out, if we would have just had the average COVID response of, of the developed nations in the world, we'd have 180,000 more people living. Okay? It, it's, a, it's a death network. They promote death. All right? There is, is utterly no reason for this, other than they say, you know what, it, 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 it was like what Ford did in the Pinto. Yeah, so many people are going to die in here, but it's cheaper for us to just pay off the judgments than it is to recall them all and put the gas tank in a different place. All right? If, if they don't do this, you know, they were shaken right after the November election where people were moving to Newsmax and One America Network. And they have decided... But they don't care how many people they kill or anything else. They've decided to go all in as the sort of center, center for anti-science thought, if you will. And they don't care how many people die for it, obviously, at all. And the one thing we know about these vaccines, I don't know, probably 150 million, 170 million people have taken them, and they're all walking around. What's that to wait on? There's nothing to wait on. And they just keep promoting this cultural anti, you know, the, the Rand Paul and Dr. Fauci thing. It's so stupid. You know, it's just stupid. He's stupid. I don't, I don't care if he went to Duke Medical School. He's stupid. Or let's play this. He may not be stupid, but he plays a stupid person on TV. Yeah, he does. And But it goes to your point earlier about uh, about the, the right-wing Republican Party. It's a party of grievance. They have to have grievances. They attract people uh, by this kind of stuff. They have to attack. Uh, and this is, in many ways, the worst thing they're doing. I mean, I don't like Tucker Carlson's racism. I deplore it. I hate some of the things he said. But this is this is really threatening people's lives. And uh, it's just, it, it, it really yeah, is it, unconscionable. It, 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 but it, no, it's not threatening. Yeah, it's it killing is. people. There are people that are dead today that would be alive if right. it would be for Fox News, right. period. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. 
Okay, keep those letters and emails coming in. Uh, they are terrific questions. But Aaron, again, if you if you send another question, we want to know where you're from. Now I want to take a second to tell you about one of our favorite things here at Politics War Room, and that's Magic Spoon Cereal. What's so great about Magic Spoon is that they have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. That's only 140 calories. It's amazing. Gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. And listen to this. Now, wait a minute. Hold on to your hats your seats, whatever. We have exciting new news. Magic Spoon has released a super delicious, James, I want you to listen to this, new flavor, birthday cake. Birthday cake Magic Spoon will be available in a special five pack for a limited time only. So get it while you can, birthday cake. Or for our family favorite, build your own box that you can customize with cocoa, fruity frosted, peanut butter and cinnamon. And don't forget, if you're listening from Canada, Magic Spoon now ships there as well. All right, James, you're going to have to put birthday cake on that list. I, I, I will. And, uh, Magic Spoon disproves James Carver's basic theory about food and diets. And that is the better a food is for you, the worse it tastes. The worse it is for you, the better it tastes. See butter and salt. All right? However, what Magic Spoon is, it, it's got you know, a dynamite nutritional profile and it actually tastes good, which is really rare. I mean, very rare. It, 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 it's a hell of a product. And, you know, I'm sure Kai, your, your, your grandchild, is going to love the birthday cake because, you know, our kids love birthday. Oh, you? wow. He may he may be a turncoat to blueberry and uh, and peanut butter and his other favorites. Birthday cake may. And he's a great lab. Uh, he's a great laboratory for this. I mean, if a three-year-old says he loves it, you know he loves it. Uh, so it's Magic Spoon is terrific. Go to magicspoon.com slash warroom to grab the new limited edition birthday cake or custom bundle of cereal and try it today. Be sure and use our promo code warroom at checkout to save $5 off your order. This offer is now good anywhere in the United States or Canada, but only when you use our code at checkout. Magic Spoon, James, as we know, is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, and I can't imagine why you wouldn't, but if you don't, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Hey James, my outrage is gonna is gonna ignore all the political outrages that we live through every day, and it's gonna go to baseball, Major League Baseball. It's medical staff and the players' union. This week, a premier pitchers: Jacob Degrom went on the injured list. Steven Strasburg has been out for a month. Justin Verlander may miss the whole season. It's not just pitchers; multiple position players are out injured. Look back at the '60s at Bob Gibson. Averaged over 270 innings a season for a decade. 30, 35 starts were par for the course. Mays and Aaron played full seasons. There is more sophisticated medicine today, more physical therapy, more time, and more knowledge of the body. And yet, anecdotally at least, baseball is plagued more by injuries. The owners and the players have a very acrimonious labor relationship. But to look comprehensively, at this and try to figure out why and what to do about it is in both their interest. If you need new medical staffs, get them. James, we're both great baseball fans, and this largely remains too much of a mystery. Yeah, I, I think one of the issues with pitching is that average pitch has just increased in velocity so much, and the things that they do to their arms are, over a period of time are just more stressful. You know, some of these... You know, I don't know how many innings that, that Bob Gibson pitched before he was 21, but it's probably significantly less than somebody who's a top pitcher that's being drafted today. I mean, that's all they do is throw. And they throw, you know, and they're taught to throw with the biggest stress point you can on your arm. And I think it just causes the human arm can only do so much. And this might be part of it, but you're right. It, it, it Injuries are part of every sport, but, but – 
I don't have the data right in front of me, but it seems like they're increasingly part of baseball in a way that, that's not good for the health of the game. Uh, the outrage is I, I alluded to earlier. It, 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 it is something, well, yeah, we got Marjorie Taylor Greene, but you got AOC. Right? Excuse me. AOC might be, I think, there's some political nativity, maybe, but that's about the worst I can say about it. Roger Taylor Green is literally out of her mind, and there are many more of him. And, and, and I love the equivalency. Well, you, yeah, you, you can't have someone that, that doesn't believe the election was stolen as the number three person in our caucus, but look at you. You couldn't have a climate denier as the number three person in your caucus. I mean, that's so outrageous on his face. I mean, some of this. The, the but on the other hand, thing that we do is, is just absolutely ludicrous. So I, I continue my personal jihad against that the way that they just sneak their talking points in. You know, it, and Marjorie like Green, anti- Marjorie Green is not unique. She's no, awful, not, but there are a number of Marjorie we could ask that. There, baby, There's Louis Gohmert, there's Paul Gossett. We used to think Louis Gohmert was the craziest guy in the House. He may become a moderate now before this thing is all over. Uh, I don't think he, Louis, I think Louis is going to continue to entertain us. Oh, I hope. I, no, I don't, really, but uh, okay. Simon? I tell you, you, you got to watch. We need to do a segment on who's crazier, Louis Gohmert or Clay Higgins. Because Clay Higgins, oh, yeah. I'm gonna tell you, he's got he's got real potential. I, I, well, we, I mean, we, we we talked about that, and then we never did it. I think that's. Yeah, I'm gonna give you one be- Clay Higgins fact. He is the only human being that's ever been censured by the Annie Frank Foundation. That's so, pretty good. That's yeah, pretty that's good. that. That's a yeah. That, I've been to Annie Frank's house in Amsterdam, and he went in front of the. The Auschwitz or somewhere <laughs> tried to do a political stunt about, you know, compared to, to the Holocaust. And it, he's too stupid to know how stupid he is. Well, that's a, it'll be a close contest because Louis is right up there. We can come up, we'll, we'll, we'll do that one week. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carvel and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we would really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsor, Magic Spoon. We really thank you for supporting them. When you do, you help make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning.